Well, good evening. It's good to see you tonight. I'm going to ask you please to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. And in our study of 1 Timothy, we have made our way to verse 18, and we're going to read down to verse 20. We won't get all the way through verse 20. We'll pick up where we leave off tonight on this coming Sunday morning, but we're going to begin 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare holding faith in a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Lord, it is a joy to gather together tonight with my brothers and sisters. Lord, we thank you for your many mercies to us. We thank you for how you have loved us in Christ. Lord, you have forgiven all of our sins. And you have transformed us so that we love you and we love each other. We thank you that we are not the men and women that we once were. We are truly new creatures in Christ Jesus. New creations. And, Lord, for this we have um, no one to thank but you. We ask that tonight, as we open your precious word that is holy and true in every part and as a whole, inerrant, infallible, carrying, Lord, your authority, And as we open your book tonight to preach and to teach, I pray that you would so empower and work that we would be careful and accurate in what we share and say, and that, Lord, your word would go forth and your power by your spirit, and that, Lord, you would deal with our hearts tonight. We come here tonight of people who are blessed. We also come here tonight of people who are in need of your blessing. Work, Lord, for the glory of your name. Work for the good of your saints. And if there be anyone here tonight with us who isn't a believer, we ask also, Lord, that you would work for the salvation of sinners. We ask you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. If I were to ask you to choose one word that would describe your responsibility as a steward of the gospel of Jesus Christ... One word that would characterize your responsibility as a Christian living your life in this present age, right in the midst of this world as it is, right in the midst of the culture that we're living in. Or if you think about the ministry that you've been given, there are elders here tonight, there are ministry staff people here tonight, deacons here tonight, Sunday school teachers here tonight. If I were to ask you to choose one word that characterizes your responsibility in the ministry, what one word would you choose? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 2 says this, Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. And the word trustworthy is the Greek word pistos, and it means faithful. And that's the word I want you to think about with me tonight, the word faithful. What should be your goal as a believer living your life in this present age? It should be that you would, you would finish this life, and it could be said of you that you were faithful or in the ministry, that you were faithful. We recognize, I hope, that living the Christian life is not easy. In this day and age of preaching, it seems sometimes that that's almost how the Christian life is presented, as though it's you know, the greatest party in the world. 
someone tonight uh, described what's going on in some churches as six flags over Jesus. But it's not that, is it? I mean, if we strive to live for Christ, listen, it's the most joyful life there is. It is life, indeed. It is true life, but it is not a picnic. Is it accidental? Is it an exaggeration that Paul would choose to describe the ministry in terms that make use of military terminology? You think that's accidental? That he describes the ministry at times, for example, he says to Timothy, be a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Is that accidental? Is it an exaggeration? To describe the Christian life in terms of a warfare. Or if you go through the pastoral epistles, you not only find the ministry described in military terms, you also find it described in athletic terms. And he talks about discipline and training and all that has to go into an athlete being successful. It's hard work. Is it accidental that he talks that way? Is it, is it just an exaggeration of some sort? Not at all. The Christian life is a warfare. In fact, this warfare is as old as the fall. All the way back in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 15, when God is pronouncing the curse upon the serpent, he said, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Christ is coming, the offspring of the woman, and he will crush the serpent's head, and yet he will be wounded in the process for our transgressions. And being described in that verse are two families. The offspring of the woman and the offspring of the serpent. So that you have in the human realm, in the realm of flesh and blood, you have godly people and you have ungodly people. You have people who are living for righteousness and you have people who are characterized by wickedness. And yet, do we realize, the Bible also says to us, Ephesians 6.12, that our warfare is not against flesh and blood, is it? We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Does it ever dawn on you, Christian, that you are engaged in what is truly a cosmic conflict? I mean, there is a spiritual battle going on in the heavenly places. Holy angels and unholy angels. God and Satan. Unholy men and believers in Jesus Christ. So that if anyone ever thinks that the Christian life is not a battle, you have underestimated what it is. And so in the midst of the battle, you know, as you strive to live... A life that is pleasing to God as a husband, as a father, as a friend, as a worker at your job, uh, as a citizen of the nation you belong to, as a servant in the Lord's church. When you think about all the areas where you're striving to please Christ and you think about all the struggle that's involved in that striving, the question is, how do you live that life faithfully? How do we emerge faithful? And so tonight, from verses 18 and 19, I want us to think about how to remain faithful in the ministry. How to remain faithful in the ministry. In verse 18, Paul says this, This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child. What charge? Well, what has he been talking about in verses 3 and following? He's been talking about this responsibility that he left Timothy to carry out in Ephesus. What is Timothy to do in Ephesus? Well, there are false teachers there, right? Legalistic false teachers. And what Timothy is to do is he is to remain there in Ephesus. We read that in verse 3. He's wanted to leave Ephesus for some time now. Paul is telling him, no, I want you to stay there. Because you have to defend the gospel, Timothy. You have to defend the gospel. Again, it's not, it, it hasn't been a sidebar when Paul has been giving us his personal testimony in the verses that precede these verses. When, when he breaks out into doxology, that's not a distraction from his main message. He's actually illustrating something. Timothy, here is what is at stake. 
What is at stake is the very gospel. What is at stake is this message that, re- that explains who we are as believers. We have come to know God through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ, and we have come to know Christ through the good news that God has made known concerning His Son. The gospel brings men and women to faith in Christ. Salvation is at stake. And this is the gospel, the glorious gospel of the blessed God, that is the the blessing of God, the glory of God, the praise and worship of God is also at stake. If the gospel is distorted, God will not be worshipped as he is to be worshipped. So Paul has given his testimony, that's salvation through the gospel. He breaks out in doxology, that's the glorifying of God from redeemed lives... And he has left Timothy in Ephesus to defend all that. To stand against false teaching, to stand against false teachers, because God's glory is at stake and the gospel is at stake. All of this is connected. The question is, how is Timothy going to be faithful to this charge? How is this timid young man who struggles with spiritual courage, how is he going to be faithful to the task that he's been assigned? And friend, how are you going to be faithful to the task that God has assigned you? Well, there are four things I want to point out tonight as we think about how to remain faithful. And I don't look at. I know this because I look, look around and I see the faces, and I know you. Some of you have been given some difficult assignments. And I hope, Andrew, you don't mind me saying this, but I look down at my friend Andrew Peck, and I think of, about a man who is who is right now living, striving to live a godly life as a single individual, and praying for the salvation of his wife. That's a difficult assignment, isn't it? And for every Andrew, there are other situations just like that represented right here. Well, how do we live faithfully in what we've been assigned? Four things. The first one is this. Faithfulness remembers divine authority. Faithfulness remembers... If you're going to be faithful, you're going to remember divine authority. Paul says in verse 18, this charge, parangelion is the word, Uh, it, it speaks of a commandment. In fact, the very same word is used back in verse 5 when Paul is talking about the apostolic message and he says the aim of our charge so, so the word can be used of instruction, but when it's used of instruction, it's instruction that carries weight. It is authoritative instruction. It is apostolic instruction. So this word speaks of a commandment. And it's used uh, in, in the military realm. It's used of a military commandment. It's used of an order that has been given. Paul is, is assuming... You know, the posture of a commander. And he's treating Timothy here like a young soldier. And he's saying, listen, here are the orders, son. Here's the charge I'm entrusting you. Here's the commandment you've been given. This very same Greek word is used in Acts 16.24, for example. Speaking of the Philippian jailer, when it says, Having received this order, same word, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. So this is an authoritative command. Now someone could have asked, Paul, who are you to be commanding Timothy? Who are you to command him to stay in Ephesus? Right? You look back at verse 3 again. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus. And that is, I mean, that's something he's to do. You do what I'm telling you. Stay there. Paul, who are you to command Timothy? Or someone could have said to Timothy, Timothy, why are you listening to him? If you want to leave Ephesus, leave. I mean, who is this guy to tell you where to be? Well, listen, if you don't believe... That God called Paul to serve as an apostle. If you don't believe that God 
called Paul to have a leadership role in Timothy's life, if you don't believe that Timothy, to be subject to God, is to be subject, in this case, to apostolic authority. In other words, if you don't believe in divine authority, then the answer is Paul is no one to say this, and Timothy doesn't have to listen to him at all. But... Obviously, Paul didn't believe that, and Timothy didn't believe that, and that's why Paul, as a shepherd, in a, in a shepherd's role, is giving this young man a commandment, and this is why Timothy, in a servant's role, serving the Lord God, ultimately, is responsive to this commandment, because both of these men understood and believed in divine authority. And I say to you tonight that this is how we're going to remain faithful in the Christian life. We have to believe that God's authority matters. Does God's authority matter to you? Does God's authority carry weight with you? Does God's authority bind your heart and bind your feet to His will? This is a, a, a tremendous point of importance for us as we strive to be faithful, we have to understand that what we've been, been commanded by God to do in Scripture is not something we came up with. We are not preaching the gospel on our own authority. It's not even our message. It's God's message. He brought it to us, He opened our hearts to it, and now He's commissioned us to declare it. It's God's message. We are not structured as we are, as you know, striving to be a New Testament church with elders and deacons and order and the way we do things. We didn't come up with that. We don't do this on our own authority. We don't do church on our own authority. We do it based upon the Word of God. We are not striving for the salvation of sinners and for the maturity of the saints. We're not devoted to evangelism and discipleship because we just thought, you know, this would be a good thing to do. No, this is what the Bible says. We're not preaching from a book that came into existence by man's authority, but rather the Bible itself claims to be the very Word of God. God breathed so that this book came into existence. It, it expresses God's breath, God's authority. This is God's creation brought into existence through men, but nonetheless not on man's authority, God's authority. We don't defend the faith. We don't resist false teaching and teachers on our own authority. This is something that God has literally commanded us to do. We have been given a charge. Why live out what the Bible teaches about being a husband? Because God's commanded it. Why raise our children in a way that reflects the nurture and admonition of Jesus Christ? Because God has commanded it. Why strive to, live, strive to live pure and holy lives in a filthy and impure culture? Because God commands it. Why oppose divorce and insist on one man with one woman for life? Because God, what? Commands it. Why say, despite the fact that the culture revolts at the idea, why say that homosexuality is indeed a sin? Not the unforgivable sin, not a sin that people can't be delivered from, but why do we say it's a sin? Because that's what the Word of God says. And we will not, we will not be faithful to the will of God until we understand the weight that the will of God carries. It carries His authority. And His authority must matter to us if we claim to be His servants. Faithfulness remembers divine authority. Paul says, I charge you, Timothy. I command you. But notice the second thing he says in verse 18. He says, this charge I entrust to you. To be faithful, we don't just remember divine authority. We also remember divine trust. That is, we think not only about a commandment, we think about a commission. We have been commissioned. We have been entrusted with a great gift, with a great treasure. 
That's what the gospel is. It's a trust from God. That's what the will of God is made known to us in Scripture. It's a trust from the Lord, the knowledge of Jesus Christ. It is treasure that has been entrusted to us, a deposit that's been given into our care. So that what we're called to be is faithful stewards, trustworthy stewards of what has been given to us, imparted to us. This word can be translated committed. This charge I commit to you, Timothy. Luke 23, 46. Then Jesus calling out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirits. The same word. Acts 20.32, when Paul met with the Ephesian elders for the last time, he says, And now I commend you, same word, I entrust you, I commit you to God and to the word of his grace. So it's, it's handing, in this case, handing these men over to God and to his word. And then Paul uses this word, if you just look over to 2 Timothy for just a moment, just to the right there, 2 Timothy chapter 2, he uses this word in the second chapter in verse 2. Look at chapter 2, verse 1 of 2 Timothy. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, what's the next word? In trust, same word, commit to, faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Timothy, you take the things I've taught you, and you teach faithful men who will then teach other people as well. Do you ever stop and realize you've been given a stewardship? This ought to motivate us to faithfulness, the understanding that God has given us a responsibility that now we have to be faithful to. It's as if the baton has been placed in our hand, you know, from a past generation. We, we need to understand the truth has come down to us. Yes, we have the scriptures and, and that message has been passed down to us from one generation of believer to another generation to another generation. Faithful men teaching what faithful men taught them. And now the baton has been placed in our hand and we don't have the right to sit down in the infield and stop running because we're tired. We have to pass on the truth to this generation and to a future generation. It's interesting to me, and I thought about this a lot today, it's interesting to me that Paul used military metaphors and he used athletic metaphors. And obviously the spiritual message trumps the illustration. You know, wherever military service or athletics is not like what the truth says, we'll do what the truth says, do what the scriptures say. But it's interesting that he makes those comparisons because obviously there's some way for that to communicate. There's some kind of similarity there. And I was thinking about the fact that I happen to be raised in a family. My father loved sports, and so I played sports all my young years. And, I, um, and I'm thankful for the time that I spent in athletics because in the natural realm, I learned some life lessons that, that have spiritual comparisons. And now in my knowledge of Christ and of his word, you know, I can, I can take that, that natural thing that I had and sanctify it. I can see some connection there, and it's, and it's stayed with me uh, in my life, even to today. For example, I learned in sports that you don't evaluate your own ability, someone else does. Right? You don't judge yourself, someone judges you. Namely, the coach. And you think about our service to the Lord Jesus Christ, and we need to stop and realize something. One day, our service will not be judged by our standard. Our service is going to be judged by His standard. Church, do we realize that tonight? You know, the choices we're making, the counsel we're giving, the things we believe, the way we live, do we stop and realize that one day the standard will not be our own? The standard by which we will be, be tested for the purpose of reward is the standard of Jesus Christ himself. And where do we find that standard? We find that standard in Scripture. In sports, I learned that you don't play selfishly, you play for a team. 
And when you think about our service in the Lord's church, we are to be living for each other. What is most important is not what is best for me. What is most important is what is best for the Lord's church. The church doesn't exist for me. Rather, let me exist for the Lord and His church. Lord, how can I serve you best? How can I best serve your people? I learned in sports that you have a a job to do. You have a responsibility that's been given to you. And if you become lazy in that, if you fail in your responsibility, other people suffer. A team is only as strong as the individual parts, each one doing his job. And I wonder sometimes if if we realize in the church, do we stop and think, you know, we are not living lives that are spiritual islands. What you do in your life affects God's people in the relationships that exist in the church. I mean, how you're doing is going to affect other people. If you're given spiritual responsibilities, your faithfulness matters not just to your own walk with God. Your faithfulness matters to the body of Christ. I can't tell you how many times over the years that I've been in the ministry, I've thought to myself, you know what? I don't have a right to quit. Which is something else you learn in sports too, right? If you, especially if you have a, a good father who's a teacher, you don't quit. You sign up for something, you find out about halfway through you don't like it. Anybody else have this experience? What did your dad say? You're going to finish what you started. I want to quit. You're not going to quit. You're going to finish what you started. And as we walk through the things we walk through, dear child of God, understand something. You're not living just unto yourself. Other people, what God's going to do in and through you, it is dependent upon your faithfulness. You don't have a right to quit. The baton's been passed to you from a past generation, and you have the responsibility to pass it on to the next one, and you can't sit, can't sit down on in the infield because you're tired of running. He says, I charge you, Timothy, there's divine authority. I entrust to you, I commit to you, there is a divine trust, a commissioning. Now, you be faithful with that responsibility. There's a third thing you see necessary for faithfulness in verse 18. Faithfulness remembers divine confirmation. He says, this charge, I entrust to you, Timothy, my child. You notice, even though he's, he's using military terminology, there's affection there, isn't there? My son, my child. I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them, that is by those prophecies, you may wage the good warfare. Now this is something that happened in Timothy's case. It doesn't happen anymore. But what happened is when Paul decided that Timothy, led by the Spirit of course, that Timothy was going to accompany him and, and, and the... The body of elders of the presbytery laid their hands on Timothy to set him apart and commission him for service. At that time, New Testament prophets spoke messages over Timothy from the Lord that indicated what his, the the fact, at least we know this much, the fact that he would be involved in future ministry service. Somehow, Timothy's calling was confirmed through prophecy. And also, and this is not the norm today either, at that very time there was some kind of gift that was imparted to Timothy for service. 1 Timothy 4.14, if you just look over to the 4th chapter, same book. 1 Timothy 4.14, Paul writes here, he says, Do not neglect the gift you have which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Timothy, you have a gift. Now don't... Don't neglect to use it. And then look over to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 
And look at verse 6. For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Look back at, at our text. So at the time that Timothy was set apart, there, was, there were prophecies given related to Timothy. A gift was imparted for service so that there was no being mistaken on Timothy's part. There was no doubt God had called him to ministry. External to himself was this confirmation from God that God had called Timothy to do this work. Now notice what Paul says about this in verse 18. He says, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you. In other words, I'm charging you. Listen, what I'm charging you to do agrees with what was prophesied about you. But notice what else he says. He not only says in accordance with those prophecies, he says by those prophecies. He says in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you that by them, by those prophecies, you may wage the good warfare. Son, you are in a war and it is a good warfare. You are, you are engaged in a battle for what is right. You are engaged in a battle for what is true. You are engaged in a battle for that which glorifies God. You are engaged in a battle that has to do with the true gospel. Now I want you to remember, son, I want you to think back to when those hands were laid on you. I want you to think back to those prophecies that were made about you. And I want your remembrance of God's confirming work upon your ministry to carry you through these tough times. Yes, you've got a tough work ahead of you. Yes, it is not a pleasant work you've been charged to do, but you let those prophecies, the external confirmation of God's calling, carry you through these rough times. Well, that's not the pattern today. But I would ask you, even though prophecies are not uttered over ministers today and, and a gift is not imparted through the laying on of hands but rather at the time of conversion even though that's true is it, is it still true to say that God does in some way confirm when he's called a man to the ministry are there confirmations what kind of confirmation is there well look at ch chapter 3 of 1 Timothy and look at verse 1 because now in the third chapter, Paul is laying down some things that are going to go on throughout the rest of time. This is the standard. This is the norm. And he says in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. You see, one of the evidences of God's calling on a life is a desire. I mean an insatiable, won't go away, you'll never be fully satisfied doing anything else in your life kind of desire. When God calls a man to the ministry, he gives him an aspiration for the office, a desire for the office. But then you go down beyond for verse 1 and what do you have? You have qualifications. So if a man's called, not only will he have a desire for it, he'll be qualified for it. And we get down to chapter 3, we'll deal with the qualifications. In addition to that... The very fact that you have hands laid on a man, and that we're told not to lay hands on anyone suddenly, the very fact that, that there is a confirmation process that goes on in the church says that there's an additional kind of confirmation, and that is the body of Christ, the body of God's people saying, you know what, I see giftedness in that man. I see that God has supernaturally supplied that man with what he needs to preach the Word of God, teach the Word of God, shepherd souls. There is evidence here that God has called this man for the ministry. And of course the elders recognize that, but so does the church. It is evident to the church. And I think we could add to, to that last point, sort of put underneath there, the idea that where a man has really been called and gifted, there will be objective evidence. That is, people's lives will be blessed by the ministry that he carries out. There will, there will be that kind of evidence. God blesses the work of his hands. So that when things are tough, what do you have to remember? You have to remember, first of all, the desire you've always had to do it. 
Go back, you know, to when the Lord first called you into the ministry and think to yourself, remember, remember the insatiable desire in your heart to be engaged in the ministry. Don't allow yourself to turn into someone who is a hireling. Don't allow yourself to turn into someone who you do what you do because of some other reason. No, because you desire to please the Lord and to serve His people and to be used for the glory of His name. That's the reason. That's the reason to be in the ministry. And when things get tough, remember how He has prepared you for what He's called you to do. How He has gifted you, yes, and, and that's one aspect of it, but also remember all the experiences that He's walked you through, all the, the ways that He has added the ingredients necessary to produce a life that is able in some measure to be a guide and a shepherding influence to His people. He prepared you for this. He hasn't sent you into the battle without weaponry. He hasn't sent you into the battle without what you need to do it. And when, when things get tough, remember, remember that he has, he has confirmed your calling through the church. I mean, someone else saw this in you. This wasn't something you appointed yourself to. This isn't something that you were sort of entered into in a delusional fashion and everyone said, no, he's not called, and you ran anyway. I mean, if, the, if we're doing our job as churches and if men aren't, sort of doing it Lone Ranger style, and if the church is confirming these men and recognizing their giftedness, then what a confidence will be imparted to them for times of trouble when they're able to say, you know what, I, I was in a church, they didn't lay hands on men suddenly, and those elders in that church, they said that they saw what I believe that I saw, and they saw God's giftedness in my life. And what an encouragement that will be when times get tough. And beloved... Hear me, unless the Lord sends awakening to our nation, if we think times are tough now, just wait. They're going to get tougher. The time will come when people will no longer endure sound doctrine, but will gather to themselves teachers who will tickle their ears, tell them what they want to hear. And as times get difficult and as men are severely criticized and perhaps poorly treated for doing what is pleasing to God, how will those men remain faithful? They must remember a divine command. They must remember a divine commissioning and they must remember divine confirmation. God has called me to do what I'm doing. I'm not out here on my own. I've been sent. And because I've been sent, I have everything I need to, to be faithful, and God himself promises to be with me. I think it's very important to remember also, if you look back at chapter 1, to remember the good nature of the conflict you're engaged in. Wage the good warfare. Now, folks, what I've said about ministers, listen, this applies to whatever ministry you're engaged in. You know, David talked tonight as we began about trying to witness to your family members around the holidays, how difficult that can be. And, 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 and David knows this. He'd have been the first one to say this, but I do want to add this. We must be led by the Spirit in those situations, right? I mean, there's a need for wisdom and balance and understanding the right time and the right way, and all of that is true. But here's what we can know. What we're sharing with our loved ones, does that carry divine authority? I mean, are we just sharing our opinions or are we, are we sharing God's Word? And have we been commissioned? Do we have a stewardship to share the gospel with people we love, people we know, people we come in contact with? Yes. And has God equipped you? Has He given you the necessary ability to share the faith with others? What's the answer? Yes, so that when things get tough, you're not out there on your own. You haven't done this on a whim. This is how we remain faithful. Here's the last thing. We finish with this tonight. Faithfulness remembers something else. Faithfulness remembers devotional consecration. How do you remain faithful? I'll say it simply. You stay close to the Lord. You stay close to the Lord. You cannot remain faithful in your own strength. 
He says in verse 18, please turn your phone off wherever that's at. Verse 18, this charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, look at verse 19, holding faith and a good conscience. And the word faith there does not have the definite article. It's not holding the faith. It is holding on to subjective, personal faith and a good conscience. So the, the way you remain faithful is as you walk in faith. How do we come to Christ? We believe God. How do you live the Christian life? By believing God and His Word. How do you handle whatever it is you're facing in a way that's faithful to God? You believe what He says. And you act on what He says. You hold on to faith. And sometimes, beloved, it's hard to hold on to the truth. But you hold on to faith. And in connection with that, you also hold on to something else. You hold on to a good conscience. Now, I'm gonna, I'm, I feel sorry for the Tuesday night crowd because you're going to hear this a little bit again on Sunday. But I, I, I pray you'll forgive me for it. Because I'm going to cover just a little bit of ground I'm going to cover on Sunday morning. Paul not only uses a military comparison here, he uses a nautical comparison. He, he compares faithfulness to sailing a ship. And notice what he says. Hold on to faith and a good conscience. Next statement. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith. I'm not going to dig into the details of that tonight. But here's, here's the only thing I want to pass on to you. Holding on to a good conscience. If you can imagine personal faith and a good conscience like an anchor. When you pull up anchor, when you start to act in an unfaithful manner with respect to God's Word, when you no longer believe what the Word of God says, when you begin to give in to doubts and you begin to drift and you begin to grow weary in terms of, of doing what the Word of God says, and when you begin to pull up the, the moral anchor of your life, and you begin to allow things to happen that violate your conscience, do you know what happens spiritually? You begin to drift like a ship at sea. And where does a ship end up that loses its anchor? It ends up on the rocks, doesn't it? The word shipwreck there, I am getting ahead of myself. It actually is made up of two words, and one of them has to do with breaking something apart. I mean, it's a graphic image. A ship broken apart on the rocks. And where did it begin? As we pulled up the anchor of belief and a good conscience. When people begin to drift morally, it's not long before they drift doctrinally. Because they begin to look for a message that will justify the lifestyle they've chosen. Because they want to pursue sin, now all of a sudden they read the Word of God in an entirely new way. Isn't that a frightening thought? That you would read the Word of God through the grid of a conscience that isn't good. I exhort you, and I want you to exhort me. I love you, and I want you to love me. And we need to say to each other, brother, sister, let's be faithful. If there's one word that would describe how we want to finish, it's faithful. And how do we stay faithful? God's authority means something to us. What God has entrusted to us means something to us. What God has confirmed for us means something to us. And devotionally, we stay close to Him. We hold on to faith and we keep a good conscience. And in that way, we don't drift. And we don't end up shipwrecked.
May God help us all to help each other to remain faithful. God's people would say, Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father in Heaven, we we do now lift this to You as our prayer. Our desire is to be faithful to You. And our desire is to exhort each other all the more as the day is approaching. And I pray for me and I pray for my brethren, Lord, that we would not be pressed into the world's mold. But we would transcend that mold through the renewing of our minds. That we would present ourselves to you alive from the dead, living sacrifices ready to do your will. I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen my brethren and myself. That, Lord, we would live faithful lives. I pray that we would love each other enough, Lord, that if we see drifting occurring, we would encourage each other. Lord, we confess that what you create, you sustain. Lord, you brought us into existence and we cannot sustain ourselves. So even as we strive to live faithful lives, we fully and joyfully acknowledge that you must supply the strength for that faithfulness. Lord, we need you. And so help us, Lord, to remain near to you in our walk. Lord, we know you're always with us. We know in that sense we're always near you. But Lord, in our walk, in our devotion, help us to stay close to you. We ask you for this tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together, please. We'll be dismissed with song.